All right, Bernie Kosar here with top dog Hanford Dixon. Whoop, 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 whoop. For 58 minutes and five seconds yesterday, I was so excited and looking forward to being here today to be doing the Bernie Kosar podcast with Hanford Dixon, episode number three. Uh, so much anticipated talking about being 2-0 and for the first time since 1993 when the old dog right here was cubing our favorite team, the Cleveland Browns. Yesterday, though, at one minute and 55 seconds remaining in yesterday's game for, unfortunately, only the second time this century, um, a team has lost a two-score two score lead in the final two minutes of the game. And it's the first time since 2001, which I sadly was our Cleveland Browns against the Chicago Bears. God, um, we had this awesome alumni weekend. We were teed up to take this next step to be 2-0. and um, We had all our alumni in. Um, Friday night, we had an amazing uh, uh, charity golf and alumni golf with our teammates and, and ex-brothers who uh, we were on the field together. Had a dinner at uh, the great Robert Jackson's with a lot of our ex-teammates and stuff. And Robert was, his last year was my first year in the NFL, and he helped me so amazingly with my, um, my uh, entrance into the league and, and the rookie not hazing me and, and, and my ability to start playing early. And he has a beautiful daughter, Stacy Jackson, who gave great advice to how much she loves the podcast and that this would be really kind of cooler to um, do a lot more uh, episodes and segments, Top Dog, of the old days and the, um, the way it used to be in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Well, today would be a beautiful day to heed that advice with the way the last minute and 55 seconds went. I'm not sure we're going to be able to do that quite today. So we're going to go over a little bit of what happened yesterday because I can't believe that we're one on one right now, Top Dog. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about Alumni Weekend first, but it, I, I thought it was just a great weekend. It's just good to get a chance to see all the guys back in town. I mean, just some of the guys. Uh, I, you know, I was expecting to see uh, guys like uh, some of the guys that didn't make it, like a Webster Slaughter, a Frank Minifield, guys like that didn't make it, but we had uh, Eric Metcalf was in town. Uh, Kevin Mack, uh, uh, Dick, uh, Judge Dick Ambrose, mm -hmm. just to name a few of the guys that was here. And, Bernie, you hit it right on the head. I mean, it all started Friday. Uh, a golf tournament, by the way, that my group won. Yes. You know, and I have to and I was I was yeah. the official yeah. scorer, yeah. so yeah. I witnessed that the eraser was not used. Yeah, and I have okay. to say I hit it pretty damn good, if I have to say so myself. But, uh, I don't want to give you too yeah, many compliments yeah. <laughs> for the for the listeners out there, okay? And and I don't want to screw up your your uh, your betting games in the future. But you absolutely have uh, elevated your golf game. <laughs> <laughs> but we 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 play well. That was good on Saturday, and then uh, some of the guys went to practice uh, Saturday morning, and then uh, we had the uh, dinner uh, over at the stadium where we inducted uh, two members into the uh, Legends Club, which was and want to say congratulations to both of those guys. Uh, uh, and their families, and then it all uh, ended up yesterday uh, at the game with uh, everybody. And now I'm going to kick it back to you, BK. Well, you know, before I, before you, uh, I bring in our awesome producer Dave Big Play McAllister here, um, talking about the alumni guys, and you know, it was awesome the guys who showed up. It was amazing to see some of the ex teammates, our friends like that, our brothers that we really fought and uh, fought with on the field. Um, but Canford, you mentioned some of the other guys who weren't able to come and, uh, and not to get into a litany of names and stuff of some of our, our ex-teammates who, um, from a physical standpoint, from a health standpoint, and heck, bluntly from a financial standpoint, aren't able to physically and or financially make it to town and, and to make it into um, um, awesome weekends like this. So. The, we talked about it in the first couple episodes. We're going to absolutely be doing things from a fundraising perspective to make sure that some of the guys that aren't doing well from a health and wellness perspective were able to get get um, get help to them because it's it's really it's really as as we get older something that's that's really a, a focal point even on a sad yeah, day yeah, today yeah, yeah, when yeah. you have such a such a rough outcome to a game where even on Steeler Week. We still should be 2-0 heading into it. Big play! What do you want? Big play!
Come on, big play. What the hell are you doing over there? What's up, Hanford? How we doing, man? <laughs> Good, big, my man. So Gab is on assignment today, not with us today. We thought it would be the perfect time, Steelers week, to bring in an old timer who's actually gone to the games. Gab wasn't alive during these games, so <laughs> we need the old timer. Big play, Kenny Miles, joining the show. Yeah, guys, as the old timer, hey, we want to hear all those old stories, and we got some great footage from Alumni Weekend. We're working that in over the coming weeks. But as a 62-year-old guy who's had a lot of heartbreaks, and you guys were on the field for some of them, I don't think anything could compare with that meltdown yesterday. Worst loss since we came back in 1999. From the fans' perspective, guys, this is a cutting-edge show. Don't hold it back. What the hell happened out there? (laughs) <laughs> it's time for the opening drive. Oh, I was, go ahead, B. I'll let you have it first. I'll let you. I wanna, I wanna, I wanna absolutely throw up at the outcome yesterday. And I, I don't say that to 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 throw digs right off the bat. I don't throw, say that to be cool on the podcast and stuff. For guys who put too much emphasis on wins and losses, um, I'm proud to say that. That's the type of attitude, that's the type of focus you have to have to get those type Ws. Um, I absolutely believe, there's no doubt, we should be 2-0. I want to be 2-0, and I absolutely want to go over the, the ways that what happened yesterday that, that really crystallized, especially at the end, what, what, what transpired to make sure it didn't happen. But it is imperative from a team perspective that the guys, the, the guys remember the Marty Schottenheimer statements that he used to make with us, that the season is a marathon. And as sick as we feel today, um, the Cincinnati Bengals are 0-2. The Steelers are coming to town at Steeler Week. They're 1-1. And the Ravens blew a game Almost as bad as, as we blew the game yesterday. Wait, Bernie, Bernie, we'll get into all that. Yeah. We got to know <laughs> what happened at the end. Hanford, big dog, defense, tell us what happened. Well, God damn it, I'm not going to hold back. <laughs> I mean, when you look at it, it all started right from the beginning with that damn thing they put in the middle of the field. I think that's where the pro- all the problems start. We are the dogs. And, uh, not, that's, the elf. I not, mean, the elf. not the elves. Not the elves. I look around, that damn thing is in the middle of the field. That is the problem it jinxed us right off the bat and then after that i know everything was gonna go uh downhill but man it was just absolutely wow look at as we have the play up there and as we're looking at grant delpert on that elf right there look at as look at as you see both the the corner the denzel to the top of your screen and and um delpert coming off the elf there at the snap of the ball to the first probably 10 yards, you have both the guys' eyes looking straight in the backfield. Um, at this stage of the game, uh, understanding where you are in the field, where you are in the game, not wanting guys for sure to get behind you. It's, it's a mortal sin right there. But for my top dog here, yeah, my DB, yeah, coach I, me up. Bring yeah, me back to earth here. I'm, I'm going to bring you right back on this particular play because it was just horrible. I mean, just absolutely horrible. When you look at it, you got Denzel, you look at him uh, at, at the top right there, safety, they in what they call a two-deep coverage. Uh, Denzel's job right here is to keep an eye on the guy threatening him him and then also keep an eye on on the on the back coming out in the flat now he look at him right there now he's got a linebacker right out there in the flat so that tells him he's got to get deeper not all not only does he have to get deeper the safety have to get deeper but it's going to be really really hard for the safety to make that play because look where this ball is caught look how close this ball is to the sideline when the receiver catches the ball okay that's why that's a long ways for the safety to go even though bernie the way this thing is designed the safety have pretty much half of the field in this coverage but it, that's a tough, tough play for him to make. So I look at both of these guys. I think they're both wrong uh, in this coverage. You cannot have a play like that, especially when the position that we're in in the ball game. You cannot let them get behind you. This is two weeks in a row. This is happening. That's a damn problem. Yeah, and if, unfortunately, I concur with you. Um, and the, actually, how we talk about it, we had a look at this play probably 20 times to get the get the feeling for it. And, Dave, if you could run it back one more time. Because – we're, we've settled on that we do think it's cover four quarters coverage. Uh, Josh Johnson uh, down to the bottom of the screen has the X receiver. Grant Delford on the top of the, the elf's head right there. 
should have a double team when the number two receiver releases to the flat like he does with the guy there on the 36-yard line there. Um, but to your point, you, that's a tough run for him to get to the deep corner of, of the field there. So really, Denzel and, and Delpert have to get their depth at this point in the game. Hey, Hanford, what, yeah, cover what, four. What, what is Delpit doing there? Because he, he's not moving. Where, what, what's going through his mind during this play? Well, first he's got to he, he's got to see if anybody's coming down the scene at, scene at him. Okay, F right away, Deppert see that he sees that no one's coming down the scene at him because that particular guy he's in blocking, and now his half of the field goes to the outside along with Ward. So okay. his head should turn immediately he, to the left outside he, when it's, when the tight end blocks, chips, and releases to the right. That immediately should send his head in a true quarters coverage. He, now that if I'm, he, we're assuming it's quarters, if that's a quarters coverage, he should have. Now you see his head turn. That should have happened in a true quarters coverage. Well, five steps early. You're absolutely right. Now if he turns and run toward the receiver that's almost to the sideline right there. You could see there's another receiver starting to threaten him, but you look at the other safety, the other safety, no one's coming behind him, so he's carrying, he's taking care of this other receiver. Look look at this guy. There's no one within 10 or 15 yards of this guy after he catches the football going into the end zone. That is crazy. I but, mean, that is, that is insane. So, you know what? As Browns fans, here's what we want to know. Joe Woods... Why don't we have a third safety out there? Why don't we put a picket fence up? How does a ball get that deep with a minute, 58 seconds? 60, it's unexcusable. Well, you, you know, these guys, I mean, they got uh, two defensive backs, Coach. I mean, two of them. Uh, I, you know, when you, when, you, when you look at these guys, I mean, uh, this is the second week this has happened. I guarantee you uh, everybody's getting on Joe Woods. They're giving him a hard time. But I guarantee you he probably grabbed – he wanted to grab uh, one of those defensive back coaches by the throat. And said, so what the hell is going on here? Because uh, obviously these guys, for this to happen twice and pretty much the same coverage twice, I mean, that's a problem. Yeah, and, and to uh, as players, we have to take initiative and, and responsibility on ourselves from, from that perspective of it. Yeah, and, but you, you know what, guys? We keep hearing, and we're digesting this play, we keep hearing breakdown in communications. We've had that for three years, breakdown in communications. Breakdown in communications, the end of the second quarter leads to 14-14 after we dominated that first half. And now we're hearing breakdown. What did we do in the offseason? What did we do in minicamp? What did we do in training camp? What have we done well, in the preseason? Here, here's absolutely one of the things that is, is, is an issue with football teams. Now with restricted time in practice, restricted time in OTAs, training camp, and then actually restricted or shortened condensed time in um, the, the, uh, the preseason games and stuff. Um, with from from that perspective, the Cleveland Browns. I love our talent level, uh, defensively, offensively. I mean, we have as much talent as anybody in the league. But we said this on the podcast in on, in the first one. We're the youngest football team in the NFL. We're 25 years of age. It's not making an excuse for it. But when you maybe don't have your football legs underneath you, and you're uh, the youngest team in the league, your attention to detail, your discipline, you make mistakes like that, you lose your focus a little bit. And well, those are the type of things where um, you, sh you, know, you know your stuff in the heat of the game, or in the, uh, sitting in a, um, a meeting room in an air-conditioned room like we are here today. But in the heat of the battle, with the chaos going, these younger guys, there may be that communication issue and that maybe not attention to detail and, and the lack of focus. Well, and, and also, uh, uh, BK, I mean, th th these guys, I mean, it's just totally ridiculous. First of all, they don't play in the preseason. I mean, they don't play. I don't think uh, Denzel Ward or a lot of those guys at any time going into the uh, preseason to uh, uh, play and get ready for the regular season. Uh, I think that's a problem because, you, you, you know, they worry about them getting hurt. But football is a, you know, is a violent sport. I mean, that's the chance we take when we put on those pads every time we go out there and we play this game. And I don't care how it is. You can't just uh, – uh, Game-like situations totally different from practice. I mean, you have to play it. You have to be out there. You have to get it done in order to uh, in order to know what's going on. Get that speed as the game as the, as the game is going on. Well, that, you know, that leads into to rookie on rookie. We got a play that we're going to show up here in a minute where Emerson gets smoked by Garrett Wilson. 
Tell us what happened here, Hanford. Yeah, I, I think this is pretty much a technique thing because I guarantee you, and I'm not tooting my own horn, I could fix this guy. Uh, what I want you to concentrate on when you see this is watch his legs. When the receiver come on, watch how wide his left. Boom, Boom, he's dead already right Thanks. there. He's dead because he can't get his hands on the guy. And there's no reason why he shouldn't be able to get his hands on any wide receiver because this guy, he's long, he's tall, and he's also fast with it. But show it to you again. I used to always say it. I used to do a little drill with my feet. I used to bounce, 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 and I never let my feet get out, get show, outside of my shoulders. And you have to keep your feet right in there. And if you can keep your feet in there, you're not going to turn, and you'll be right in there, and you can get your hands on the guy. And that was the problem down there. And when you're down there in the, in the, in the red zone, you cannot afford to not get a jam on the wide receiver because you know as a quarterback – that fade is deadly down there. So the fade, is, the fade, and the release of the fade, especially uh, against press coverage, and and then even more so, uh, epitomized in the red zone, in the scoring zone, inside the five. Um, unfortunately for us Browns fans, Garrett Wilson does an exceptional job as a rookie to understand what Hanford's talking about about. Top dog talking about getting your feet, getting your balance off, and then pressing the hip. You see Garrett Wilson do a, a step inside, a head shoulder inside, and then his head goes inside to press his hip and to get his feet off balance um, to almost make it look uh, multiple times like the slant is coming. He gives Joe Flacco so much beautiful yeah. room outside yeah. to to make just a really from a pro perspective uh, an I, easy I, throw. I'm going to tell you another key, too. If you can uh, tee that up and show it one more time, I want to take a look at uh, – uh, see, one thing I used to always do, too, here, you have to steal as much of the ball as you can. You have to get as close as you can to the wide receiver. As you could see, this receiver is on the line of scrimmage. Okay, if he's on the line of scrimmage, you don't need to back up. You need to get, without being out, outside, you need to be up on him as much as you can, and that will help you get your jam. You can't just back off of him like a guy's in the slot. Now, I can see that if a guy's in the slot, then, you you, you know, he's going to have that little separation right. with you. And you, and you have a better chance of having Correct. help over the Correct. top to where you have Correct. that. And, and I joke, I used to joke a ton with you, Top Dog, and with corners. And I used to use this this phrase a lot that some of the least violent people are the cornerbacks yeah. on the football field. Yeah. That wasn't you. Yeah. Okay, in press coverage yeah. and at the line of scrimmage, it's almost like a, do a backyard dog fight right there where you yeah. have to get your hands on it. And when you're the X receiver on the line of scrimmage, yeah. that's actually playing into yeah. your hands as a physical cornerback to take that initial step away from him and get your hands on it because you you can hold, press, make contact up until those yeah. five yards. And if you, I, I want to make this key. Uh, if, if I could tell any young cornerbacks out there that are listening to us, that are looking at us, uh, uh, talk about this. One key that I want you to remember, if you're bump and run, first of all, keep your weight down. Don't raise up in the air. Keep your weight down and keep your feet at shoulder width. And if you could do that, I guarantee you, you'll see where you're able to get the jam. And the next best thing is head position. Because yeah. you see a lot of these guys, they panic mm -hmm. when the ball is in the air. We have what we call a DB guard. And <laughs> hope that he's there if you're beat. Don't panic. Just once you're able to touch the receiver, turn around and look for the ball. Because if you turn around before you get to the receiver, can touch the receiver, you're not going to make the play anyway. You know mm -hmm. if, it's, if it's a perfect throw from the quarterback. So don't panic. Keep your feet, keep your weight down, keep your feet shoulder width, and I guarantee you, if you're young cornerbacks out there, that will improve your play. Yeah, that's actually awesome advice, not only for young cornerbacks out there, young athletes, um, young football players for sure at any position. What Hanford said before that, too, in terms of not panicking, but what he said before that in terms of keeping your base, keeping your basically your backside underneath you, understanding your balance and stuff. Don't be standing vertical. Having a, having a bend in your knees, being on the base of your toes, that gives you that lateral ability and that ability to kind of get your physics and uh, getting your, uh, your inertia going in the right direction. You know, so Hanford, and uh, as the old timer here, nobody better at it than you and, and, and Frank Minifield. You guys, you should be coaching these defensive backs. And I hope in those meeting rooms today, they're saying you got to touch that receiver. You got to get that jam. But you know what? We had a. We hey, had you a, know, I'm sorry. Actually, we were talking about this last week on the podcast. Um, and a lot of teams are. Um, 
a lot of teams are doing this, not getting the jam. Um, and that's how um, on the slot receiver last week on the 75 yard post to Robbie Anderson, um, the, the slot receiver gets a free release up the field, gets on the safety, Josh Johnson, to create a little bit of that indecision. And I'll say this real quick. I, 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 I think I, I just don't think they're being taught this. I, and, and because I, the reason why I say they're not being taught this is because I don't see it. Mm. I don't see them, uh, the majority of them, I don't see them doing it. And I think they're actually afraid of the jam because you, that's why you see a lot mm. of them, especially like you said in that slot, all they do is they, they turn trail. and they, yeah, they turn and run. Yeah. They, they open up. And when you open up, then the receiver has got you in, in, in his hip pocket and he can do whatever he wants to you. And you can't let that. You have to dictate what he's able to do. That's why, you know, as an old timer, again, I keep saying it, but we we got to have you go, Hanford, and talk to these defensive backs, burning you on the offensive side of the ball because we were the, we were the best in the NFL at what we're talking about right now. But now let's flip it over to the offense because we said, hey, Jacoby Brissett, a little shaky last week, but it looked like he managed a great game this week, Bernie. You know, d- well, let d- me say this. But hold on. Hold your thought. Let me say this. 22 I, for 27, um, 229. BK, I told you. 43 I yards told rushing. You, I told you I wasn't all in with this guy. I like him. I like him. But I'm, I'm not all in with him. I mean, you tell me. I mean. <laughs> so we are who we are. And I don't mean that. I mean that as a compliment. He's an NFL quarterback. He started a lot of games. He's winning football games. He had a winning performance yesterday. Um, it was drastically improved from a winning performance the week before. Is it optimal? Is it somebody that you want to have week in and week out for the next multiple set of years doing that? Um, He played so good yesterday that I don't even want to overly respond too much negatively to it because offensively, that uh, in terms of player production yesterday, that really wasn't the issue. I I love the – and there's been a lot of talk of game plans, play calling, how do you start Jacoby Brissett and that. Boy, yesterday, the way the game started with – uh, Coach Stefanski and doing the, the the running game, but really doing the play action stuff, the tight end, the running back, the flats, the screens, the way to incorporate Harrison Bryant, David Njoku early in the game with, I don't want to say easy throws, Cooper. but yet, yeah, Cooper, oh, well, Amari Cooper with, with nine targets, nine catches, 101 yards. I mean, he showed his dominance in route running yesterday. Um, but to see... To see how Jacoby was handling himself, that really wasn't the issue from, from that perspective yesterday. Um, one of the things that I, I, I really loved about Jacoby in, in the initial start of the game was him not trying to do too much. And, and the way, he uh, again, Coach Fansky and him had those plays going. Um, at the end of the game, uh, there's a lot that could have been probably in uh, as the Monday morning quarterbacks here kind of re- reflecting on that to see um, to see us well, go, well, going what, up what 14. Did, or what, did you, go up what 14. did you see on that on that interception there at the end? I mean, you know, the pick uh, uh, that he threw um, trying to bring us back in the glory and win this football game. What did you see on that? Did, did he just not see the safety coming underneath him? You know, when you're in those situations and – You've, you've got really desperate situations. You have to take some excessive chances with the ball. Is that a throw on first down that he'd be making with 40 seconds to go in the game, 35 seconds to go? I highly doubt it with less than probably 10 seconds, 11 seconds to go there. You're trying to fit it in there to make, to make that field goal and a, a, a significantly easier field goal from, from that point of view. He actually... Uh, Probably wants to throw that just a split second quicker, but but that's really the stuff that happens really at the end of the game with that uh, in terms of trying to make a play when you sh- you put yourself in a situation you shouldn't have been in. I'm just you can say what you want to say. This guy, I'm just not uh, I'm just not all in with you. Yeah. You know the thing the thing that was tough yesterday that's that's coming out right now is you know we're up seven. There's you're trying to get a first down. Uh, the Jets and Joe Flacco give us the ball back um, with third and six with about two minutes and 20 seconds to go. 
We get Kareem Hunt on a great, great screen call. Again, we Coach Stefanski, Alex Van Pelt, the way they come up with these manipulative, creative personnel groups and screen plays um, and kind of cheap, easy throws um, on third and seven to get that first down. It's a lot to expect, but we get the first down with two minutes and 15 seconds ago. Kareem goes out of bounds on with two minutes and 15 seconds ago. And then on second and six, we get the first, Kareem gets the first down again, goes out of bounds with two minutes and two seconds to go. Okay, now the clock stops. Um, Nick Chubb um, on the 12 again. yard run, he, he scores, okay, with a minute 55 to go. Now, People are saying, boy, Nick Chubb should have known. He should have taken a knee. And then, and, and in retrospect today, if the football gods were uh, on top of everything, we wish we would have done that. But, well, to, say, but to say that well, Nick Chubb should have known that, well, that's a big reach. Well, I, that's, the, that's where I'm headed with you because, you, you know, again, I told you I'm, I'm, I'm not in with Jacoby, but let me ask you a question. If Bernie Kosar is in the huddle, Shouldn't the quarterback, shouldn't those things, the quarterback, obviously it should come from the sideline, okay, to remind these guys of these different situations and things like that. But since you're in the huddle, if Bernie Kosar is the quarterback, I have a hard time believing that you're not telling these guys and getting these guys pretty much ready for every situation and, and how to manage the clock, like not run out of bounds and things like that. Top dog. Okay, this is like we set yeah, this up. You know. I had no, yeah. I had no anticipation of talking about this. I had no real feeling to bring this up. This is was not scheduled, not scripted, not even really thought about because it was just so ingrained in me. This is not a shot at quarterbacks today. It's not at all to dump on Jacoby Brissett right. because I don't really know other than probably Tom Brady right now, maybe who's really attuned to be able to handle this because myself with my limited athleticism and the way I had to mentally attack the game. Yeah, Hanford, there's no doubt. I'd have been all over that. I was a taskmaster in the huddle there. There was, you go over every situation, um, Marty Schottenheimer, um, coach Snellenberger, Jimmy Johnson, Don Shula. I was so ingrained as to how to understand the details of the assignment, how to manage out, finish out a game, close somebody out. Uh, the coaches had me so ingrained with that, that that was something that you're so right. In today's game, even more so than the old school days, coaches, sidelines, the field, people, somebody else is supposed to inform you of that. But... And again, this is not at today's quarterbacks. This is not at Jacoby and stuff. But I just assumed coaches were going to blow it back yeah, then. And I had to yeah. make sure I knew what the hell I was doing so that that crap didn't happen so that you ended up with the W. Well, just like we said, Hanford's got to be coaching the defensive backs today. Bernie, you should be working with the quarterbacks. As a fan, we don't understand why that's happening. But for as good as those play calls were, and Stefanski is an offensive coordinator doing a good job, a lot of us are questioning – is he the head coach? Should he be the head coach? And if he's going to stay head coach, then head coach and hand the plays off to somebody else because then you manage the game, you know what's going on, and you say to Jacoby Brissett, take the knee, make sure you do it. What do you, what do you guys think? Should Stefanski be calling plays? I love how he's calling plays. I love the system right now. With uh, Other than we got to work on our drop back game with it. You see a lot of teams that right now that are struggling at the end of games. And the, the, as the offense is getting better and as we're starting to make plays, this may be a time to absolutely start thinking about that because I think the game is getting so fast and the game's getting so sophisticated and we're getting more mature as a team. We still have the youngest team in the league that to have a, a smart man like that overseeing, overseeing the, the big picture stuff because I think now you're on your, I think, third year of working with yeah. Alex yeah. Van Pelt. Yeah. You feel comfortable with him. You got Chad O'Shea, an yeah. outstanding uh, wide receiver coach. He's been a coordinator before. Stump, uh, Mitchell. Stump Mitchell and what our running backs are doing, exceptional. Coach Callahan, offensive line, another awesome shout-out to an amazing physical dominating uh, game yesterday by the O-line. So this may be a time to absolutely consider that. So you have a, um, a more macro view of things at the end of games. Yeah, I, I think uh, – uh, see, some guys, uh, head coaches that are calling the uh, offensive plays, they have a hard time giving it up. 
I mean, they have a hard time giving it up, and I think uh, Stefanski is one of those guys. Uh, obviously, you got Van Pelt, who has the title of offensive coordinator, but we all know uh, him and uh, Stefanski may get in a room and they may get together and collaborate on which plays they're going to run uh, during the yeah. ball game, but we all know who's got all the say. Yeah. Hey, and, you know, uh, and, and and that's uh, and that's Stefanski. He's the guy who's pretty much uh, uh, making all the calls and making all the plays. And you know, I, I agree. It may be a bit much uh, for him uh, at this stage, but uh, but, but, uh, but right hey, now so he just but, he just can't give it up. Well, one of the things is there. That's that's a trait amongst all of us. We want to keep calling the plays and. And one of the things that uh, maybe is is uh, you could think about is I had a, I had the reputation I called a lot of my plays, but I love suggestions. I actually like when somebody else called the plays and we worked in such unison together and such trust that you called the plays, but it really was a suggestion. If I could maybe make a suggestion and stuff that you could still actually be calling the plays because you and me. You and uh, me and uh, Coach Van Pelt were working in conjunction together, and this may be a little, somewhat of how it's going too, where um, Alex or, uh, is calling the plays, and it's almost a suggestion that you reserve the right as the head coach to all, always chime in and change it. Mm -hmm. um, so you're mm -hmm. almost mm -hmm. giving a Overriding. blessing to Overriding. it. Overriding, so yeah. If there are crucial situations now, you're able to at any time override that decision and that's that sometimes gave me the best of both worlds and that may be something now where I, I think the staff's been together enough and they feel enough comfortable with each other that, that may be a way to kind of but, go to the next level but with guys that. guys okay so the, the head that coach, won't help yesterday though. that won't, have <laughs> that yesterday, won't help we the, can't have this keep happening we can't have this keep happening we had breakdowns on special teams now let's go a few more minutes on this one because we had a Muffed punt. We had a fake punt. How does that even happen? Uh, I, I again go to coaching, but we got to talk about that onside kick. It's not a successful play, but somehow we call timeout. We put Amari Cooper over there. No shot at Amari Cooper. He had a great game, but I don't know that he's supposed to be on special teams. And it certainly didn't look like he was coached as to what to do, because you, as as a somebody who's played high school football, you knock the ball out of bounds. Well, I, I think he was coached on what to do, but uh, he just uh, didn't want any part of it. Uh, you, know, you, know, you, know, you, know, you know, we call those guys hands teams. Uh, you know, what they do is they grab a bunch of guys and, and they pretty much uh, – you don't see a lot of defensive backs on that team mm -hmm. because uh, we don't. We, yeah. Defensive backs. If you guys could catch, you'd be receivers. <laughs> we don't. <laughs> we, we, we're what they say don't have good hands. But normally you got running backs, uh, wide receivers. Uh, That's uh, a record tight show. End. You said uh, yeah, that. I just yeah, concurred. Yeah, yeah. Guys like that are on that what they call the hands team. But I saw pretty much what you saw and what everybody else saw during that play. I mean, during that play, Amari Cooper. Did, when I say he didn't want any part of it, he didn't want any part of it because you have to be a tough guy to be on the hands team because those guys are coming at you full speed, throwing their bodies out there, and they are trying to get the ball. And that ball came to Marty, Mari Cooper and looked like he just, instead of jump trying to jump on the ball, looked, I don't know whether he was trying to get out of the way or turn his head or something, but if you don't, if you don't want to get on it, knock the ball out of bounds. That way we still have it. Well, the top dog. We were we were on a halftime yesterday with uh, Josh Cribbs. Okay. And, you know, I, as a quarterback, I'm probably the least qualified guy to talk about special teams and onside <laughs> kick play. But the Josh Cribbs had said that he had thought, knowing that the, the kick was going to go to the left, that more guys should have been over there um, with Amari Cooper um, as that ball was going there. But you're right, being more physical to get the ball out of bounds at any cost is, is coaching, typically you want people that, coaching, that want to do that. Coaching, coaching. Well, That's where head coach, you know, well, you're not calling offensive plays. You're going, you're in those meetings, Bernie. No? Well, well, I say, you know, if you say, I understand what Josh is saying, and, and, and he should, he should, he is a special teams guru, but it, I think if you load more guys over there on that side, I think the kicker, if he's a good kicker, he's not going to do it. He's going to run up there and he's going to kick it to the side where he's got the better chance of uh, getting the ball. It so, is, it's almost, it probably is almost do, like yeah. a, a check with me on offense. Yeah. I'm, go, I'm running the ball on these check with me's to where the guy, there's less guys out there. And 
and to to Hanford to your point or to to angry Ken today's <laughs> point on that is um, Brant the the special teams coach for the Jets is a guy named Brant Boyer. Brant Boyer was a teammate of mine with the Miami Dolphins at the end of, end of my career, beginning of his career. Then became a uh, player and a, and a coach at times here for the Browns when, when we came back in the early 2000s. He's an exceptional. He coached us yesterday. He's an exceptional young man, an exceptional uh, football player. He was one of those guys that got drafted, um, was going to be a training camp guy, got, got cut and stuff, and was an overachiever, crazy on a special team. He, his coaching and what he did with his team, whether it's the fake punt, the onside kick, um, that was, that was to- unfortunately for us Browns fans, top tier yesterday. Hey, I know we're talking about the uh, onside kick, but what about K York, guys? I mean, oh, come man. on. He Browns- goes from, he's, he goes from the penthouse. <laughs> guys. I mean, he was, you know, he's a rock star. And then because if you look at it, the score actually would have been 31-31, but he just – Hanford, moved. as a fan, when that when we miss an extra point as a Browns <laughs> fan, you know. You just know it's going to come back to haunt. It's amazing whether it's at the be- end of the game like that or the <laughs> right. beginning, the, the ramifications. And, and with that as a Browns fan, and not to be the temple of negativism, yeah. Yeah. as a guy who's massively wants to be positive in this fourth quarter of my life, but to see the um, – even though we should have probably taken a knee and not got into the end zone, still to have got the end zone, to be yeah. up 13 with a minute yeah. 55 to go, Cade York coming in, yeah. the formality of the, the extra point to be up 14 as we're all getting ready to put the W in, in the win column, to see that materialize like that, I – Part of me said, heck, that's a bad sign, but this may be the one time an extra point doesn't, doesn't cost No, us. Bernie, as Wrong. a fan, as a fan, I Wrong. knew it. I knew it. I knew it. So now it's a short week. It's Steelers week. Before we get to the Steelers, guys, fans want to know, what's the locker room like today? What are the coaches saying? How do we put this out of our minds and, and move forward? Oh, this one for me. Um, this is with Steeler week. And as disgusted as I am as a as a fan, as an ex-player, I'm even more disgusted at, to wake up this morning or to go to bed last night as a player and coach, knowing I let one get away, knowing I was going to be uh, 2-0 and and leading the division, leading the conference, best record in the NFL. So that absolutely has me sick. I know, though, today when you wake up, uh, and again, we're the youngest team in the league, so I'm assuming this is we were more of a veteran team. We um, and we understood and we kind of policed ourselves with this. But it's imperative to understand today that we have Thursday night football. It's Steeler week. We got a nationally televised game. The Steelers uh, lost their home opener yesterday. They're one and one. They're not singing roses in, in uh, Steeler land today, talking about what's going on with them offensively. Uh, I love Joe Burrow, but the yeah. Cincinnati Bengals can't protect him. Yeah. He's yeah. 0-2 right now. So, yeah. really, the season is magnified with this game because of what happened at the end. But players today, they got to be super focused. The 24-hour rule doesn't apply to a loss after uh, with a Thursday night game coming. Well, when I look at our, it, 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 I look at our football team, and I, I question whether or not we're as good or if 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 they think they are if we think they are because uh, I knew this Jets football team was a good football team. I knew it was a good football team going in. I mean, they had a great, great uh, uh, set of guys up front where they rotate them uh, four in at a time. Yeah, we talked about that. They had a really nice job. They they, they, kept their guys fresh, their D-line fresh yesterday. They they keep those guys fresh. Uh, When you look at them on offense – I think they did more on offense to stop themselves than what we did to stop them because they had a lot of penalties. They had a lot of drop passes. And uh, I think that really, really hurt them. So I just. Yeah, unfortunately, I, schematically, they, they had a nice scheme yesterday. They uh, Coach did. LaFleur uh, they uh, had a did. nice. They did. And, 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 and they're, they're a decent, decent football team. 
But getting to this week, this is a short week. I agree with you. This yeah. is a short week. And you're right. I mean, we, we, just, we just have to forget this thing. This one is gone. We lost it. It's gone because the Steelers are coming in here. And I'm telling you, they're going to they're gonna have – they got a nasty attitude because they lost just like we lost. I think the fortunate thing is we have them at home and we don't have mm-hmm. to travel. So that's a good that's, thing. That's imperatively – It's tough Im- trying to travel on a short week. Yeah, that's imperatively important on these Thursday night games as when you have the home the home game with and you know and as you as we're saying this it, it keeps kicking in my head the words of our awesome uh, head coach Marty Schottenheimer um, he used to say the season is is a marathon not a sprint so to not get overly fixated on on things early in the year but he also said that you really really need to put things in a rearview mirror even to the point where if you make a bad play, if they beat you for a touchdown, which they didn't do that much, or you throw a pick, that you got to put that behind you, not dwell on it, and move on to the next play. Easier said than done with the, young, uh, with the youngest team in the NFL. Same principle with this game yesterday. You got to put that, you got to learn from that last uh, minute 55, but you got to put it behind us and solely focus on the task at hand. All right. I'm not, I, I get it. <laughs> Youngest team in the league. I'm one of the oldest fans in the league, and a lot of us out there, we don't have that many games left. We can't give them away. But as those fans were booing as they were leaving the stadium yesterday, we'll put it out of our minds and get ready for Steelers Week. The vaunted rival Steelers are coming to town. <laughs> So now we got to turn our attention to them, and I'm going to take you guys back to the old days against the Steelers. Because I'm going to tell you, as a guy that was in the stands, hey. as a guy that was in the stands, you don't come into our house and take it. In fact, there was the fights dog in the- pound. Guys, you don't come don't into the dog know, pound. I don't know if you knew what it was like in the stands, but we would fight in bloody noses and. <laughs> And playing at old Cleveland Municipal Stadium was not easy. What was it like for you guys with Steelers? Week? Hey, for you, uh, uh, angry Ken, to be saying that I didn't know what it was like to be as the fan in there. As a little boy growing up in Youngstown, to, to have been able to go to Cleveland Municipal Stadium as a junior high, high school guy and see the fights that Ken's talking about with, with the, the fans there, whether it's in three, the old Three Rivers or Municipal Stadium. It was, and for the fans out there, I'm not, con, I'm not uh, amplifying this. We're not saying to be doing this, okay, because that was old school days. Do as we say, not as we did. But, man, the, to go to the bathroom in the old Municipal Stadium, if you had a Steeler jersey on. <laughs> it was on, a chore. That was a chore. So, please, let's not, let's not accost people like that. Let's keep it on the field of play. Some, and on the field of play, there's been some historically physical things, whether you go back to – well, that Yo, takes us in, Bernie. Hey, That's our segment. Hey, Big plays. Hey, Let's go back. Boy, I love it. Baseball field, mud. All well, spray you know, I'm going to ask you about that. A lot of uh, young fans. Oh, here they, we go. Young fans look at that beautiful stadium with that horrible elf. It should be a dog hamper. <laughs> We're 100% with you. But for when we go to that old stadium, for half the season, the baseball diamond was for the first 30 yards. Guys, and you had a muddy field. Uh, what was it like playing on an infield dirt for thirty yards? Oh, I gotta tell you, I gotta tell you that bring that seeing that beautiful picture there <laughs> brings back the goosebumps right there for me. Okay, as a guy who liked to wet the field a little bit, keep it soggy the day before the game, even if it didn't rain. Okay, that and to get that infield wet, athletes, fast guys. I'm again. I ran a five five forty. Okay, I was slow on fast surfaces or slow surfaces. So to have that that I thought you ran a four five. Oh yeah, for the about twenty (laughs) five yards. Only problem was I had fifteen more to go. But to have that field muddy like that, to have that, because it really is a landfill there. So it used to flood all the time in the, in the locker room. It used to be so soupy and wet out there. It slowed the fast guys down. So I was always the same constant speed. So the athletes came down to, to my speed with it. And I'm not, I guess this is uh, to be funny, but actually factual. When you had the infill like that, it was so easy to draw plays and draw plays in the dirt and go over coverage. Yeah. So 
of what the teams are doing because we didn't have iPads, well, laptops. Hanford, you drew up plays in the dirt. We, we know did. Bernie did, but you we, and Frank Minifield did. Let me did. tell you something. We did. And, and, and guys, I, I, I used to love this thing because – to come out of that old dugout, you know, where the... Oh, the first you, you, orange yeah, helmet hits, man. Yeah, that first yeah. orange come, helmet hits. Come, you know, to just come from under that dugout and come into that old stadium, and then you just take a look around, and you got the banners that are absolutely hanging everywhere. Because back then, you could bring your old banners in. And, uh, man, the people are just going crazy. You talk about that dirt. I used to just love that dirt because... <clears throat> But I used to love that dirt yeah, because the wide, that. when you're up there on those wide receivers, you know, uh, they, you know, they're, they're moving, they're trying to get their move and you could get that jam on them real quick, especially if you got them right there where that little dirt a part of the field. But obviously a lot of young people don't know, but that used to be, that's where the what? Indians, I mean, the, the Cardinals now no, Indians. play their game. Indians. Though, uh, they're Indians. I'm I'm old, they're Indians. Well, well, I'm say, you know, right now it's the Guardians, don't you? <laughs> no, no, I'm old angry Indians fan too. But you know what? It's Steelers. When you're talking Steelers and you're in the stands and you got the smell of cigars and oh. you're just waiting and we're hanging on every play. And Hanford, we got one play that we're going to show right here, (laughs) big dog. It was a great play. In fact, Joe Willie Namath was on the call, and he talks about this. Walk us through this. I think you tipped the ball to... To Chris Rockins. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, Chris Rockins. Watch this. I'm coming. He's trying to come across the middle, and he thinks he's open right there. I think that's Stallworth, uh, the All-Pro Hall of Fame wide receiver. And uh, he thought he was going to get one on the top dog. You now, are you talking way. trash there? Hey, are you talking trash hey, there? I'm not going to go for that. Just mm. watch the top dog. Right when he thinks he's got this ball caught, here I am coming in there with that hand, tipping it up, and there is my boy Chris Rockins, number 37, right in the right place at the right time and we needed a big play yeah and hey i'm not saying this to stroke you there top dog but (laughs) that's a that's a cover one coverage man coverage with a safety in the middle of the field so for you young cornerbacks out there and for you young quarterbacks out there cover one with the safety in the middle field with the lurker in there like uh, rock was doing there the cornerback has that, outside technique, and he knows he has help to the inside. So as a quarterback there, typically I would think that my receiver, the great Hall of Famer, yeah. John Stallworth, yeah. should be able yeah. to beat you yeah. with an inside move. Yeah. It actually shows your awesomeness to be able to actually cover him to the outside, knowing you have help inside, and yet still use your quickness to get underneath him, make that play. Because Mark Malone probably thinks that's a completion when he when he lets it go. You know, if he wouldn't have got it too, Ray Ellis would have got it. Well, you know what, Hanford? Big that's, dog, here we go. Not all we got. Here we go, big dog. I Tell him. No, wait, wait. Oh, hey, oh, Clay here we Matthews go, big dog. to Hanford. Uh, yeah. <laughs> look at the look towel. At step in. Hanford, look hey, at the towel. He wasn't hey. down. He wasn't down. <laughs> hey, that towel. That towel. That towel will get longer and longer and longer, dog. Where is that towel? <laughs> is, look at that. Oh, man. Is that Eddie Johnson? Give me a high five, five right there. It. Eddie Johnson, uh, uh, captain. Uh, yeah. Well, oh. you know, well, as we're showing that play again. I'm looking at Mark Malone, and I don't know if this is the 86 or 87 It's game. 87. Okay, but in those two games, um, um, we talk about the infield being there. This was, this was earlier in the year, in 87, when the infield was there. Um, later, sometimes uh, when the quarterback would get knocked in the ground like that, we'd actually, because there were concerts the night before, and you get pulling that dirt out of there. In, in one of the Steeler games, you pulled a lot of things oh. out of here, out, out of your face. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But well, they were still left over in the stands, too. Oh. Let's show that play one more time, because Hanford, there were some old-timers back then that are saying, look at Hanford carrying the ball. Hey, big Watch dog. how he's holding the ball. I, I turned into a running back on this Hanford, play. Hanford, you're, you're holding the ball like Brownie the Elf in half. I don't. No, 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 no. Look, look at him. Look at him. High stepping, too. No. Throw it away, dog. Throw it away. Uh, Throw it away. Go to him. Look at the the fans. I think we intercepted Malone six times that game. Six times that game. But now let's go back to 1986. This is where uh, Brown Steelers and Bernie take this away. This is that pass to Ozzie Newsom that really set us up. 
Wow, this is great memories. Actually, I'm I'm sidetracking to my last statement. In this 86 game, this is later in the year and late November, actually the week of my birthday. So some of those signs, I remember seeing happy birthday yeah, Bernie yeah. signs there. <laughs> the but the, the night before, Friday night or Saturday night before this game, there was a Pink Floyd concert. <laughs> so as me and, as we're getting jammed into the dirt and stuff, there'd be little like little roaches and joints <laughs> left over from the party favors from the night before. Fortunately, it didn't affect me because I was able to come up with these well. type of plays in the game. And as I'm looking at that, God, the goosebumps get going. Was that a blitz? Were so they that was back in the, I, in the old days where you had a bare defense, where you had eight guys at the line of scrimmage. It's a run formation that I'm out there. I'm trying to trick them that I'm running. They load up the box with extra linemen and the safety. The, the Steelers, I noticed during that prepara preparation of the week, Anytime they put two linebackers uh, over Ozzie Newsome and one outside, it always was a man blitz. Okay? Hey, did you guys hear, Birdie? Did you guys catch that? What's that? He said he was trying to trick him that he was running. Now, what? did you mean did the run, <laughs> we were going to run a run play or were you going to run it? Well, that would really trick him. They wouldn't believe that I was going to run it. But getting in That's a, my, my point. I yeah, said, yeah, yeah. you were so trying to trick Bert, him. Bertie could tell him the place. Right, they couldn't right. stop him. Right. They couldn't yeah. stop Bertie. Tell him, Bertie, you tell him the play. So these play. were the games. These were the games where you really tee it up, and you would tell him the plays and stuff. So that Because they never believed you. So you'd be able to kind of play that mental chess match. But they had Ozzy double teamed here. And I noticed this late in the week that anytime Ozzy pretended to block, Getting his pass set like he does. He stands up real quick. The guy over him blitzes. It's so coming. if we delay, just like Coach Stefanski had a couple tight end delay screens yesterday, if we delay that versus a blitz, Oz is going to be completely unblocked. Yeah. So we get a cheapy play on that audible there for a touchdown. I, I talk Lindy into putting that in, uh, me and Gary Danielson, on a Saturday morning. And, and for young quarterbacks, I don't like – putting audibles in and plays in at the last second and not really practicing them then. But we put that in like that for a special play to take advantage of a mistake in their um, in their coverage. Well, Bernie, we know you were really the offensive coordinator and you were changing plays in the huddle, and we love that. But that game was nip and tuck, back and forth, and take us through the ending. This is that Webster Slaughter catch. Did you call this play? So... So actually, that's the exact same formation and the exact same and defense. And we win right there. That's the exact same formation, the sack, exact same defense. And as you saw from the <laughs> beginning of the play, you saw 53 and 57, one on Ozzie, one outside of Ozzie. So being the greedy quarterback, I put, again, this play in. God, look at how that's just like yesterday. So I put that in like that. I go to the exact same play that we just saw in a previous play. I'm going to hit Ozzie Newsome again in overtime to close out the game, and I'm doing the exact same play. And I also, uh, I, I also believe you could run multiple plays that are good multiple times in a game. But the Steelers were really smart, too. Hardy Nickerson, uh, Brian Hinkle were their cornerbacks. The great Wa Rod Woodson was, was there. So... They had picked up that I had uh, audibled again. They knew that I was trying to get him and trick him again to Ozzy. So at the last second, at the last second, I knew that they had figured out my audible. So I did it. I didn't have time to change the audible. So back then, I'm able to talk to my receivers without using words. So Webster Slaughter had a had a cornerback on him who I didn't know his name and I didn't know his number. So if I didn't know his name, <laughs> that meant for sure I should throw on his ass. So it was kind of my insurance policy to give Webb, give Webb a fade, give him a takeoff. Because when all else fails, throw it deep well, in these a, games. That's what I was going to ask. Was that a fade or was that a double move over there? Webb look, was so... Looked like you faked him? Or, well, it was, it was almost like the, uh, okay. the uh, intentional grounding that we got away with with Jacoby at the end of the Carolina game. I was going to throw it to Ozzy, so the fake, the fake was only that they tricked, they got me, and I was trying to uh, throw to Ozzy, but they had covered it, and they were trying to bait me into throwing one of those, those plays where well, they look, cut We were up, so cut excited. I, I want you to play that one more time, but play it to, all the way to the end. We were so excited. Uh, watch this. Now, the offense is on the field. 
and we'll watch all of a sudden how number 29 make his way over there. <laughs> watch this. Oh, we thing. loved it. Yeah, we at loved the it. over there, BK. You know, uh, we're, we're so excited. You think uh, you guys well, were that, excited. Well, that's not you, uh, Hanford. No, uh, you'll see it in a minute. 29 is, uh, is, is, is coming. There he is. John <laughs> Clark. All right. We were so happy. Good old days. The fans were screaming. We're yelling. Those were the good old days. That's what this segment is about. And now we got to go this Thursday play the Steelers. Let me ask you, do the players know the rivalry? Do you think that – I know you guys knew. Do the players know how much this means to the fans? Guys? I think definitely. I, I think they have to. Uh, I, you know, I, I think there, there's someone in that building – uh, that know how important this game. I think number one, it's uh, it's a division game. Uh, both teams are in the AFC North. Very very important team. But guys, I mean, you know how when we played BK, when we played against those Steelers, I mean, we, it was all us. That, I live and die team, for this game. A team that, that's what I, I was live and say. die. I grew up in Youngstown. There was no more important game than this. Okay, and I I was the guy that all, only mattered was getting to the playoffs and giving yourself a chance to win the Super Bowl. And I say that, and I'm being hypocritical because. My father, I grew up, my dad said, if you lose every game, it doesn't matter as long as you win the two Steeler games. And growing yeah. up in Youngstown, Ohio, this game mattered. And I did not see us win enough of these games as a young boy. And when I got the opportunity to play here and then to be able to get them not in the playoffs, to see them not playing in January, the thought of them that they're going to be watching me after all those Decembers and Januaries where I watched them play, I'd live for this game. I still do. I'm going to tell you a quick story and, and, and talking about how important this game was. You know, and I, and I, I never forget I was a rookie, and I remember the guys uh, talking about, hey, man, we're getting ready to play the Steelers. This is a big, big game. This game is like no other game. So, um uh, I, I knew it was a, a big, big game. We were playing the Pittsburgh Steelers. I came the year, uh, this was my, I played one year with Brian Sight. Brian Sight was a quarterback. I came in, and uh, I never will forget this. Uh, our offense was on the field, Steelers defense. Brian Sight ran over toward the quarterback, and Jack Lambert was the linebacker. Jack Lambert hit Brian Sight. I'm telling you, I think as hard as I've ever seen anyone get hit and the antennas went up on me right then and there i said hey whoa this this is for real man yeah this but is I, this I, is i mean this I'm is nice for young kids out there yeah. this is not the appropriate statement oh. but this is how we thought it was kill or be uh, killed out yeah, there. yeah 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 very very important you know and i so i told this story i was at a a buddy of mine the great bill cosgrove at his 60th birthday party a couple weeks ago outside of Pittsburgh, and I had quite a few Steeler fans up uh, come up to me, and I, I told this story where growing up in Youngstown, um, people come up and say, God, you got to hate me. I'm a Steeler fan, and you're a, a great Browns fan. And unfortunately, maybe when I was younger, that, that statement may have been a little bit truer, <laughs> but as I get into the late third quarter, early fourth quarter of my life, I, I want to be more therapeutic and a healer and more thankful and blessed for all the great things I've been given. And so I say to people, no, I don't hate you at all. You're, you're awesome Steelers. You know, you've got six Super Bowls. You've won a Super Bowl ring in every generation. I wish I had my Super yeah, Bowl ring yeah. on today. But, you know, you got six rings and stuff. So you, you've won in every generation. Except the nine years I kicked your That's ass. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love it. I love it. I well, love it's, it. it's all got to change now. Again, short week, come back. And, and that's going to take us into a segment that we're going to be having on the show moving forward. I think the fans that are in Ohio know sports betting is starting this year in January, but everybody's talking about it now. In fact, yesterday after the game, as down as I was, I had to pick up a pizza over at uh, Master Pizza in Mayfield Heights. Shout out, Master Pizza. And talking to some of the people in the in the parking lot. We saw them at the game. We did. Yeah, we I saw, was just, we I was just getting ready to say game. that. Yeah, we, uh, that pepperoni and sausage. Oh, pepperoni, no, 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 what kind the, did you get? No, he's on the vegetarian. Double. Oh, Bernie likes he's, that. He's uh, got the vegetarian, vegetarian. vegan going. Now for us uh, juicers, me, okay? hungry, More guys. to come on that. Yeah. <laughs> get me hungry, guys. Get me hungry. But, but it's funny you mentioned that. We, we, we can I was just talking to him yesterday. <laughs> we in the cardiac club. club. Yeah, in the cardiac yeah. club. Yeah. All right. So sports betting is coming to town. We're going to do a segment every week, and it's going to get bigger and better, and we're going to bring in some prognosticators. But we're going to give our thoughts on each one of the games in our division, 
We'll do a review that'll give us a fans a chance to get your feelings and then your prediction on what's going to happen. So we're going to start with Steelers Browns. Steelers coming off a tough loss to the Patriots, 17 14. The fans in Pittsburgh are mighty upset, yelling for Trubisky's head. This might be the time we see Kenny Pickens come in. But here we go. Browns are favored by three and a half. The over under is 40.5. Guys, who do the fans take on the Browns getting three and a half? Hey, so one of Given the three and a half. one of the things on uh, Kenny Pickett, uh, Mitchell Trubisky, Mitchell Trubisky from Cleveland, Mentor High School. I uh, used to go watch him play in high school. Love how he played. Um, one of the things that you have on a short week, making a quarterback change on a short week is massively challenging. Yeah. Now, yeah. How this game goes for the Steelers on Thursday with 10 days off in between games may happen and transpire after this game. But from our Browns perspective, um, this is a probably a all in game for Mitchell Trubisky yeah. from mentor and stuff. What my from the point perspective, I, I was talking about this at the end of last week. I pro- we probably should have done this segment last week because one of the things that I kind of love early in the year is a guy who who uh, likes to score points and stuff is it was even true when I played and we did preseason, we did the uh, preseason games. We came in a little more suited, a little more game ready for games one, two, and three. But this now that you, and even then it was hard to score points early in those first games. So unders tended to be good in the first week or so. But as we started getting better, um, and getting attuned to it, and then getting defensive coverages on film and being able to break down what coverages do early in the year, um, the overs tended to be something in those weeks two, three, and four where offense was starting to catch up. So I, I like kind of how teams are able to score points now. So I tend to be, when you right, see so Bernie, those 40 put, numbers, when you, you see those 40 numbers, I try to look overs. All right, so 40 and a half. Bernie's saying take the over. Hanford? I'm going to take the under. I I, I just uh, I, I look at these two uh, offensive football teams, and I don't see them scoring a lot of points. So I'm going to take the under. All right, Browns, Browns are given three and a half. I'm going to pick the Steelers. I'm going to pick the Steelers as far as that uh, three. Browns win. Yeah. Browns win. Browns win. Browns yeah, yeah, win, but yeah, yeah. we win by two. Right, right, right. And they're going to win by three and a half, yeah. though. But I, All right, uh, Bernie, what do you take there? I, I want to decipher this as the week goes on, but right now I – I feel like uh, I want to be picking the Browns right now. I want to get us. I want to get right with this game. But with Mitchell Trubisky coming back into yeah. town yeah. and his career slash the rest of his season somewhat being on the line right now, you don't typically make a quarterback change after a win. So this is something where Mitchell Trubisky. I really believe this is going to be. Um, Something he's ready to be ready to play okay. for. All right, as angry Browns fan, I'm taking the over and <laughs> Browns win. Browns <laughs> win. Steelers week. All right, we got the Bengals at the Jets. Now the Bengals, two weeks in a row, they're 0 and 2 in the division. Two week heartbreaker field goals to end the game. Cowboys beat them yesterday, 2017. And the Jets going in. Joe Namath, Flacco. I don't know what he was. We made him look like Joe Namath, yeah. but. Uh, Bengals are four and a half favorites. The over under 43 and a half. Hanford, let's start with you. I'm going to go with the over with the uh, 43 and a half. I think uh, think Flacco is uh, starting to play uh, a little bit better. And I think uh, Burroughs is, uh, even though he threw a couple picks, six sacks uh, yesterday, offensive line problems. They can score. They got um, uh, Chase and and, and company. I think those guys can put some points on the board. So I'm going to pick the over. As far as that's concerned, and what where four and a half? They're giving four and a half to the Jets. Ooh, I'm going to go with the Jets. Jets. I'm going to go with the Jets. Uh, Jets got a good football team. I don't care, and I think they're going to get better and better. I believe in them. I believe in their head coach, and I think they. I think. They're I think, well. I think they're a well coached football team. I think they're a better team than we think, Bernie. I think so. Yeah, the Jets are a better team yeah. than we think. Yeah. You know, unfortunately, Joe Flacco um, is eighteen and three against the Browns. Just like uh, Joe Burrow's offensive line is really letting him down, really thought the Jets' offensive line was going to let uh, Joe Flacco down against our Browns yesterday. Um, the Our pass rush didn't get to him like we had thought like that. That being said, I do like the overs in, the, in this game, but 
because Joe Burrow and Cincy is almost in a desperate situation. They don't want to go 0 and 3. So for them to get, to try to get right against this team, it's a tough challenge to get right on the road, but I still like the over and and the Bengals. The Bengals although I think they're going to win, it's probably I, I think it's going to be a close game too okay. with the Jets. All right, as an angry fan, I'm going to go with the over and uh, I think I'm going to take the Bengals going to cover. I think they they're desperate. They got a good team. Maybe a little bit of Super Bowl hangover, but I think they get it right this week against the Jets. That takes us to our final game, Ravens against the Patriots. Ravens, heartbreak oh, yesterday, my. 21 points oh. in the fourth quarter, and oh. Tua looks like a Hall of Famer, <laughs> throws six TDs, three in the fourth. Dolphins win at 42-38. The Ravens are three points favorite, over under 43. Bernie, who do you have? You know, that's a, yesterday, as, as disgusting as we feel as Browns fans today, Ugh. the Ravens are right Ugh. up right up there with us. So, again, I, I, I like the overs. The One of the things with the Bill Belichick-type teams, he likes to take away what you do really good. So, But the one thing that it, it is tough sometimes for them to stop is those big physical teams that run right yeah, at you. Yeah. And the Ravens, the Ravens do a good job of being physical and coming at you. So um, as much as uh, my Bill Belichick uh, has been scarred and the Patriots, I like what they're doing. And uh, I think the, uh, the Ravens, as much as I want to see them lose, I like the Ravens rebounding. So you take the Ravens uh, giving three? Yes. Okay, over under 43. Over. Over. Hanford. I'm going to go with the over, too, because um, uh, the Ravens are going to score. I mean, they're going to score, and, and with Lamar and, and that offense, man, they're getting better and better and better. Their problem is on uh, defense. Uh, obviously, they got rid of uh, Wink Martindale, their defensive coordinator, and Harbaugh went and hired uh, uh, his brother, uh, defensive coordinator from the University of Michigan, and they are just having problems uh uh, on that defense. But saying all that, I still think uh, you talk about get right. I think uh, they will get right. So uh, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to go with the Ravens. Well, we're, yeah. we're also uh, as much as we're Browns yeah, fans, too. Yeah, we're yeah, we're yeah. Ozzie Newsome yeah, disciples, yeah, yeah, too. Yeah, we yeah, love yeah, Wiz. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I love Ozzie, but I can yeah. never root for the Ravens. Yeah. That's the old Browns. That's a story. Hey, uh, are we day. rooting? Are we rooting or using financial <laughs> wherewithal <laughs> here? I'm I'm angry angry is this I root. I root. I root. You can't let that. Uh, oh, no, I let it cloud me. I let it cloud me. Patriots got a running game. Patriots all day long, and I'm going to take the under at 43. So Wow. We're going to have a lot. Well, I think. You know what I think? I think Belichick's going to try and slow this game down. He doesn't want the ball in the offense of, of the Ravens, and uh, Ravens got defensive problems. Well, can you I, tell me who's calling the plays over there? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Is nah. it a defensive coordinator calling plays? <laughs> uh, Patriarch? Oh, what, what, uh, uh, but we do know probably there what we talked about there yeah. of if Bill's not calling the yeah. plays in, in New England, he does have the right of – of, of final say. So yeah. if he's got somebody giving suggestions and stuff, almost like we're talking about possibly with, with Coach Stefanski, there's a there's a way to kind of do a hybrid that sometimes works out, but and other times doesn't. <laughs> well, you know what? As, as much as we might say what we want to say about Bill Belichick, one of the greatest coaches, and he knows how to run a last two minutes. You don't see him blowing it with time uh, mismanagement. But all right, guys, great show. It's Pittsburgh week. I want to remind everybody – that if you want to catch the, the Bernie Kozar show with Hanford Dixon, you can catch it on the Big Play Network. Find that on Twitter. Find it on YouTube, website, TikTok, all the different social media platforms. And now let's get the final words. It's the two-minute warning. And one more tease. After the two-minute warning, we're going to have overtime. We're going to diagram a few plays. Stay tuned for that. Two-minute warning. Two-minute warning. Unlike yesterday, we're going to stay on our stay on our game for that. <laughs> I'm fired up. It's Steeler Week. I, as much as I want to be two and zero, oh, it's one on one um, after a tragic loss yesterday. But Steeler Week, first game within the division. It's a chance to put the nail in probably the Steelers' coffin in terms of setting the tempo, getting this taste out of our mouth, and to let that game go away yesterday. And that to not come up with a W this upcoming Thursday would make for a torturously long 10-day stretch before we have our next game. So it's imperative that we get our focus and get our mind right 
for this game on Thursday well, night. Well, you, 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 keep, you keep talking about get right. Get right, and I, I agree with you. That's what we have to do with this game. We have to get right. Uh, the good thing about it, everyone in the division lost. Everyone in the division lost. So we didn't really lose any ground. So we cannot afford to let these Steelers come in, a team in our division come in, in our house, in our backyard, and beat us. So we have to forget that one. It's gone. Hey, Let's get this thing. I hope this kid you're talking about, Jacoby Brissett, is everything that you say he is. I hope he can carry us for these next ten games. Uh, is hey, it's, I nine love. Games, I, I, I got to get to how you, right, I got to get to what you said about coming into our house. Yesterday, the Jets came into our house. Um, we did not close our door at the right time to get them out of our house. It's imperative that you establish your will and you establish a culture where. Anybody who comes to Cleveland, Ohio, knows that coming into our house is going to be met with a complete annihilation of the game. And to let games slip away like the, this past week and then to not take advantage of a, a nationally televised game against our number one rival, the Pittsburgh Steelers, it's sinful. So this is a tempo-setting, culture-setting game for, for early in the year. Good show, dog. I'm loving it, man. Oh, man. Let's get rid of that thing in the middle of the field, though. <laughs> All right? It's been a top dog boop, out boop, there, boop, man. Boop, you boop. matter. Go Browns. All right, welcome to uh, overtime of the Bernie Kozar with Hanford Dixon show with Bernie Kozar. Bernie, show the Super Bowl ring for all our fans out there. We're going to show in a little telestrator uh, segment here in this overtime here. Maybe the uh, Super Ring will come into display. All right, so a lot of fans know that Bernie's known for his play ability, and he can break down plays and diagnose plays and why you're not on the offensive meetings today for the Browns, I, I don't know. That's a story for another day. But uh, for all you NFL players out there, we know Bernie's not getting into the total nuts and bolts of a play. But for all the fan out there, we're going to break down a couple of key plays from that 1986 Cleveland Browns-Pittsburgh Steelers game. So why don't we roll the plays? First, this is the play to Ozzie Newsom. You know, and, and we picked up these plays, one, obviously, because it's Steeler Week and the excitement and, and correlation to what we have and we want to have happen on Thursday night here in, in Brown Stadium and stuff, but also because that was a play in 1986, but yet some of the schemes that are, that are happening defensively out in the NFL and in college are absolutely still transpiring and happening um, today. So even though it seems like 40 years ago, some of the things that work today um, or work back then still work today and some of the core principles of that. So back in the old days, for a team like us that was two backs like we saw um, with our Cleveland Browns, the Nick Chubb, Kareem Hunt uh, dynamic duo that we have happening. We had the same thing back in the 80s with Kevin Mack and Ernest Beiner, um, Eric Metcalf, uh, Leroy Horde. We had a really good plethora of running backs and stuff. So teams like today, like we're going to be seeing with our Cleveland Browns of today, wanted to stack the box. Very similar back in the old days against us. They would stack the box, and there was a um, – back in the 85 Bears won the Super Bowl with uh, the 46 Bear defense. So that was kind of the rage – Back in the back in the early mid '80s, from Buddy Ryan, that principles of that defense are absolutely still being used today, and absolutely being used actually a little bit more so today in terms of the press coverage and bump coverage um, on top of the receivers. So even back then, if we want to run that play a little bit, you'll see Ozzy Newsom has. Um, well, this is a tight angle here. It'll maybe a little better from the um, from the top out level, but through the course of the week, these are eight man fronts, and when Ozzie Newsom had two tight uh, two linebackers on him, um, it was Mike Merriweather and Brian Hinkle. I still remember fifty three and fifty seven. I didn't tell them this when we were playing, but they were two awesome, awesome players. But uh, the yeah. smack talk wasn't – I didn't want to give them compliments like that. But on uh, the whole, through the whole course of uh, the week of preparation, I would see that formation. And 
uh, Brian Hinkle, 53. Anytime the tight end blocked, and we didn't have a ton of that because Ozzie Newsom was such an amazing route runner that you wanted to get Ozzie out into the pass play, so you didn't really leave him in the block. But I noticed in the Stiller preparation that when the tight end did block, given that defense, that if the tight end blocked, the guy responsible for blocking him, the linebacker, 53, would check, delay, and blitz, and he'd wipe out the quarterback. So I kind of have that. I kind of drew that up up here. So in this bear defense, you'll have your three at 34. You have your three down linemen. Um, On that formation, you'll have Brian Hinkle, the two backers right here, um, and the other, the third linebacker, head up over your center because he's got man coverage on your running back, which is Kevin Mack. Um, Safeties are kick left. So when the tight end settles back to block, 53, 57 comes. When he settle, when Ozzie settles back to block, Brian Hinkle comes right through. So he settles, fakes like he's going to block. He releases right up the field. And as you, when you run that play, when you run that back through, you'll see Brian Hinkle getting in my face, but nobody there because I, I tricked a formation with a heavy left so I have our two backs head up to weak side. That brings the weak safety down to this side. The uh, Donnie Shell Hall of Famer, amazing player, brings him to the middle of the field. That leaves, and I'm not trying to show off the, uh, the logo for the Bernie Kosar show with Hanford Dixon, but that leaves that whole void there for a perfect logo, for a perfect picture, because nobody's there except the great Ozzie Newsom. So, Bernie, when you go out and you've got that play called, you line up, you see the defense. Do you know it's going to work right there? Well, no. First, I don't have that play called. I have something completely irrelevant so called. So how do you change it? So when I see that that, form- that that defense is the defense that they're in, I subtly, quickly change it. Because originally on this play, we had Kevin Mack over to this side. So, so you 50 was over here in his pre-snap alignment, right ultimately where I wanted Ozzy to do, be on another play that was designed to run right into the strength of the defense where they have the extra guys here. So I just move with an audible. I just move Kevin from here to here. And then instead of stepping this way, I have Kevin check and block this way to block the guy off the corner. That sends number 50 to the left, which opens up the void for Ozzy with the safety going to the top, the weak safety going this way. This was this was stealing. So yeah, and I don't know if that play actually shows it, but Kevin Mack throws a great block on that uh, defender coming around the end. And what I really love about this was besides it worked, it got us a touchdown. Ozzie Newsom's streak was in, kept intact of uh, consecutive games of catching plays and stuff, but. That was early in the first half of the game. And, and Dave, I don't know if you want to kind of swing to the second play, but the exact same situation comes up in overtime. And you can see from this view a little better Good how block again. the tight end has Ozzy has 53 Brian Hinkle on him, 57 Mike Merriweather to the outside of him, which is amazing. I can't remember what I did two <laughs> days ago, but I can remember those guys like it's clockwork. So I'm a, I, I audible to that, to that anticipating that I'm going to do the exact same thing I did in the first half. And I tried to do this audible a little quieter and a little subtler, like I wasn't audibling, but the Steelers, as much as I hate to admit it, besides awesomely talented, they're an awesomely coached, intelligent team. So I went to the well one too many times. They figured out that I'm doing. Look at Brian Hinkle. He sees Ozzy settle, but this time he doesn't take the cheese. He doesn't come. He stays on him. I'm like, oh, God, I'm screwed. Um, so that pump wasn't on purpose. That was, oh, my God, Brian Hinkle. You got me there, brother. But. I had known, I had checked beforehand, and just to the details of the assignment, trying to make sure that nothing could go wrong and to minimizing the chances of a, a mistake, I wanted to make sure that I had an insurance policy. And I looked to my left. They had the great Hall of Famer, Rod Woodson, to the, to the right. 
um, there was a cornerback to the left. I'm not saying this to be mean nor be funny, but somebody was hurt, and the new cornerback in there, I didn't even know his name. So in the NFL, if you don't know the guy's name, you throw on his ass immediately. So when they figured out the play like that, I had slipped Webster. I didn't have time to ch rechange the play to check my audible to their audible. So um, you've heard us talk about this on the air a little bit, but off the air a lot. I, ha I could actually talk with my receivers without using words, with just eye contact and or signal. So um, all of mine, I wore this shirt last week, the rock on it. All of my receivers, whether it's the University of Miami or the, or the Cleveland Browns, know that if you get the rock, okay, you are throwing, a, you are getting a fade. And what we were talking about, about releases versus press coverage, that will get open when you get the rock. And I was able to slip that to Webster um, to make that throw to win the game and close them out. You know, one, one quick point here before we leave this. You talk about the great Rod Woodson. As a fan, we worried about that guy. But tell us, Bernie. He never got you, did he? Okay. As a as a ex quarterback, as a quarterback who went against the great Rod Woodson, played him twice in college. He was the University of Purdue at the U, University of Miami. And then for him to come to the Steelers and to have those those games that we had against him. He's an all American Hall of Famer, amazing player, amazing friend. And I I never let him know that I thought about him. Um, focused on him all the time to the point where proudly he never got an interception from me and our team. And that was, that was something that his greatness and his ability actually made us better, made me better, because I was able to come up with some really cool concepts of route running because Rod was such an amazing player that it still it wasn't being run much in the league back then, but you see it a lot today. Double moves, stutter takeoffs to get him to bite and try to get something over his head. And then he was so good and so smart that just stutter takeoffs, double moves weren't good, that uh, we'd come up with extra plays like double moves to where you did double stutter takeoff comebacks because he was so great. And that was something that I'm really proud to have been able Bernie, to handle. Bernie, you won again in overtime. You're a winner with us. Break us down and take us out. Take us out on Steeler Week. Going to be 2-1. and one. You matter. Go 